But I want you to turn to the book of Acts in chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and just look at there at verse 30. Because when you get right down to it, when the Philippian jailer says, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what he did. That's what I did. That's what everybody has to do to be saved. But that was not all that you have to know. You have to know who Jesus is, and you have to know what he did, and you have to know what he said. See, Jesus is God in the flesh. He came into this world and died on the cross and paid for all the sins of the world. And he came back from the dead. So paying for our sins is what he did. But what do I have to do about what he did? Believe he did it for me. So when I believe he did it for me, I am saved from having to pay for my sins. It means I don't have to go to hell. And that's the best news in all the world. So you see there in verse 31, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and thine house. And they spake, in verse 32, unto him the word of the Lord. So there was more that they told him. See, all he had to do was trust the Lord. But if you just walk up to the general person on the street or in any country and say, believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved, they may not have a clue. What are you talking about? If, they, if I walked up to an individual, would you like to go to heaven? Yes, I would. Believe on Yankee. How would that go? Would that carry any weight to it? And there could be a lot of people named Jesus, and there are. But you gotta understand, what did this Jesus do that I may believe? If I say I am trusting Christ, it means people say, where are you going today? Well, I'm just trusting Christ. Well, what do you mean by that? It's like saying, are you saved? Yes, I am. Where are you going today? Well, I don't know. Are you married? Yes, I am. Do you have a wife? I don't know. <laughs> you would think if you believe, you're supposed to know what do you believe. You see, when you can't explain what you really believe about how you know you're going to heaven, it's difficult to tell somebody about it. And when the Bible talks about God, Jesus says this, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Now, if there's a grapevine and it's got some grapes on it, he says in John 15, you want more grapes and then much grapes. And he says, and herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So the abundant life is a fruitful life. So I've wanted all my life to be a fruitful Christian because I want to have an abundant life. I want to see people come to know Christ as their Savior. But in order to do that, I've got to have a clear gospel message. And then not just knowing it clearly, I've got to be able to present it where the lost man understands what I've said. It's one thing to get a gospel out. It's another thing to get it across. The gospel is not clear because you understand what you said. The gospel is clear when the lost man understands what you said. And that's why we're always striving for the lost man. The lost man can't come up to you and says, you know, you need to make that a little bit clearer. I, I've I got to understand a little bit more. Make it clear where they can understand. You'll notice also in that verse 33, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripe, and was baptized in all his straightway. So all you had to do was believe. It wasn't all they had to know. When they were baptized, what do you think they were baptized for? Isn't the baptism a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Do you think Paul then baptized them without explaining to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Because there's a lot of people today that say, you don't have to preach none of that. Just tell them, just believe, and you'll have eternal life. That's all you have to do. It's not all you need to know. And there's a way of eliminating a lot of people's questions and doubts about their salvation. See, I know I have eternal life. I know I'm going to heaven when I die because I believe the Bible says these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. You may know you have eternal life. Will I believe it? I ought to have eternal life. He that believeth hath everlasting life. Well, if I believe it, 
I should have something. What? Everlasting life. Well, how do you know when you really believe it? When you can say, I have everlasting life. If you can't say, I have everlasting life, it's because you don't believe it. But if you believe it, you got it. Got it? <laughs> the Bible is clear. It's simple. And that's why we need to understand that. Now, take your Bible and turn very quickly to the book of Galatians in chapter 1. Galatians in chapter 1. There is a verse here that says that people who can know Christ as their Savior and little by little get into preaching false doctrine. They begin to add things to the gospel. The Bible says it's not there. So you'll notice here in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ into another gospel which is not another, but there be some who will trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel than that which we preach unto you, let him be accursed. There is only one way for a person to get to heaven. There's no option B, C, or D. Only one way. There's only been one gospel that saves anybody, Old Testament, New Testament. We're all saved the same way. They were saved looking to the cross. We're saved looking back to the cross. But we're all saved looking to the cross. And you can't I believe, leave the cross out of the gospel. And a lot of people don't want to talk about the gospel because the gospel and the cross talks about the blood. And a lot of people don't want to hear about that. That sounds gruesome. But believe it or not, if it wasn't for the shedding of blood, there'd be no remission of sin. And that's why that is so important. Another verse I want you to see, and believe it or not, it's even on your wall over there. And maybe they're showing it on the screen. But I want you to take, for example, when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, how do you know? Remember these five words, Christ died for my sins. God so loved the world, and the way I know that is because Christ died for my sins. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How did he do that? Well, Christ died for my sin. That's how God gave his son. So it is in the book of John, and it is in chapter 3, and it is in verse 16. Now notice that whosoever, that means anybody, would believe. That's all they had to do. Why is it only thing you have to do is believe? Well, because Christ paid for my sin. There isn't anything else I have to do. You see, I was going to go to hell and have to pay for sin, but now I don't have to go to hell. Why? I don't have any sins to pay for. Why? Because Christ paid for my sins. And that's why he says whenever you believe, he says there's two things that he guarantees you in John chapter 3. I cannot go to hell. Shall not perish. How come I can't go to hell? I don't have any sins to pay for. Christ paid for my sins. You have everlasting life guaranteed. If I simply believe, I have something. I have eternal life. Means that I get to go to heaven. Why? Because Christ paid for my sin. Now, that's the only reason any of us go to heaven is because of what Christ did on the cross for us. There's another verse, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You even got it on your wall over here. But just think about that verse, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved. Why is it by grace? Why are you saved by grace? Because Christ paid for my sins. If you want a good definition of what grace is, there it is. Christ paid for my sin. That's grace. And the Bible tells us to be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anything else we ought to know and understand and believe, how do I know I'm going to heaven? Because I don't have any sins to pay for. Why don't I? Because Christ paid for my sins. Are you starting to get the point? Well, this means yes, this means no, and I hope you're getting the point. You're getting the point? Yes. All right, a few of you are awake, some of you are not. But now get Ephesians 2, 8, 9, when he says, and you're saved by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Why is it just by faith? Because that's all you have to do. He did the work. So you're faith saved by putting your faith in what he did. But you can't put faith in Christ unless you know what he did. You can't trust Christ unless you know what you're trusting him for. I have eternal life because I trusted Christ. 
I trusted that what he said was true and what he did was true. He did something for me. And then he said all he wanted me to do is to believe that he did it for me. And when I believe he did it for me, he gives me as a free gift to everlasting life. And the rest of her, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. Why is it not of yourself? Because Christ paid for my sin. That's why it's not of me. That's why I can't earn eternal life. Not of works. Why is it not of works? Because Christ paid for my sins. Why is it absence of boasting? Lest any man should boast. Because there's nothing for me to boast about. The only reason I'm going to heaven is because Christ paid for my sins. Do you understand? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? You see, when you really believe that and understand that he paid for all of my sins, you should never have to doubt again for the rest of your life if you're going to go to heaven. Because he paid for all of my sins. You believing that and accepting that as the payment for your sins and understanding why God said he'll never cast you out. He will never lose you. Never. That's the best news I ever heard. And that he says you are in my hands. This is the Lord. And most people think they have to hang on to God in order to go to heaven. But if they do something wrong, ah, now they lost their salvation. Got to get right again. And then if they do something wrong, they can lose it again. They got to get right again. See, they believe they can lose their salvation because they believe they can commit a sin Christ didn't pay for. Christ paid for all my sins. That's why the Bible says when I trust Christ, he saves me. He's taking me to, I'm trusting him to take me to heaven. So when I trust him, he said he'll never cast me out. He said he would never lose me. He says I am in his hand and no one can pluck me out of his hand. See, if you believe what the Bible says, you can know you're going to heaven when you die. But if you don't believe he paid for all of your sins, you can believe that he, you can commit a sin tomorrow and still go to hell. See, I can't go to hell today because I have no sins to pay for. I can't go to hell in the future because he paid for those too. How many of my sins did he pay for? All my sins he paid for when he died on the cross. And that's the best news to me and all the world. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn to 1 first, first Peter in chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I know most of you got the Bible committed to memory, but I do like it when I hear the leaves turning and people looking in their Bible. But here in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, excuse me, that's uh, chapter Three, I want you to go to. Let's just skip that verse, go to chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, look in verse 18. And notice what he says in verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, that's him, for the unjust, that's us, that he might bring us to God. Why did Christ die on the cross? to pay for our sins so that he could bring us to God. So what am I supposed to believe or trust? Some people just say, just believe whatever you want to believe. No, it's not okay to believe just anything you want to believe. You have to believe something specific in order to understand and give you the confidence and the assurance that you want. Otherwise, you have questions and doubts until finally somewhere along the line, I get it. I see what he's saying. I believe in telling people how to go to heaven. And I was traveling, believe it or not, one time through North Dakota. It was a little chilly. It was about 70, 70 degrees below zero. And with the wind chill factor, I was in a Volkswagen. Do you believe that? A Volkswagen. Didn't put out much heat. That rubber band back here on that little motor, I mean, it scared me to death. I thought I'm going to freeze to death. It finally died. You know what I did with that old that Volkswagen? I, I sent it to the old Volks home. Well, anyway, you know, they took a Volkswagen one time and a comet, and they put them together, and they had a vomit, a throw-up top, and eight pukey colors. But anyway, I'm driving down the road, and it's at night, and I'm scared to death that I'm going to run out of gas or, or freeze to death. That motor ever stopped. And I saw a light on at a service station. So I wheeled in there and pulled up to the gas tank, 
and it was so cold, I went inside, and those were the days when they would come out there and pump gas for you. You remember those days? They were a long time ago. And so when I went inside, I saw they had a coffee. I said, can I, can I have a cup of coffee? Man, I was cold. I was shaking. So I, and the guys, there's two teenagers in there, <laughs> and they were just watching me. Nobody else around. So I drank some coffee, and he says, what can I do for you? I says, fill it up. He went out there, and he filled it up. He came back in. He says, where are you from? I says, Colorado. He says, I knew it. I said, how you know? He said, license plates. <laughs> he says, where you been? Because he knew I wasn't coming from that way. I said, I was over in Minnesota telling people how they can know they can have eternal life beyond a shove it out by simply accepting the payment of Jesus Christ made on the cross for them. Drink my coffee. Now, I just said a mouthful. And they just stared at me. And I realized there was a clock behind me on the wall. And I said, see that clock on the wall? They said, yeah. I said, in less than five minutes, both of you guys are going to know you have eternal life and know you're going to heaven when you die. I love setting them up. You know why you set them up? Like the pins in a bowling alley? So you can knock them down. So I drink my coffee. And it didn't take long before one of them said, how do you know what? How do you know, how do you know that? I said, how do, how do I know what? How do you know we're supposed to know we're going to heaven in less than five minutes? I said, you really want to know? He said, yeah, I really want to know. I said, well, if you really want to know, let me show you something. Look, look up here. This hand represents you and me, and the wallet represents sin. The Bible says we all have sin on us. But God says that he loves us and he hates our sin. And to pay for sin is eternal separation from God in a literal fire burn in hell. But God loves us and wants us to go to heaven. But to go to heaven, we've got to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. We've all sinned. So God says you can't save yourself. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. Came into the world because he loves us, hates our sin, because our sin separates us from him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die. He took our pay for it on the cross, came back from the dead, and said if we would believe he did it for us, he'd give us eternal life as a free gift. I said, does that make sense? And the guy said, yes, it does. And of course, I, I did it a little bit slower. <laughs> he says, my grandma been trying to get me to understand this, and I never understood. All I have to do is believe. They both trusted Christ as their Savior. I said, look at the clock. They looked at the clock. It was only five minutes had passed. Most people I lead to Christ is always between three to five minutes. You don't need to take a lot more time. Most time as you're going through life, you don't have a lot of time. But you learn how to nail that thing down and make it clear and simple. I had told somebody else, I had flown all the way down into Belize, another country, and I'm lady was there. <laughs> but I had taken my wife into this country because Betty, my wife, in her 70s, wanted to, well, she wanted to go down a zip line that was 200 and something feet up in the air. <laughs> and so I got to take her, but I really didn't want to go. But she's always assured me that whenever she goes, I'm going same time. <laughs> so we go up on the thing, and the tour guide that was with me, he says, um, do I have to go? I said, you're my tour guide. You've got to go. He said, well, I, don't, I really don't want to go up there. I said, I'm sorry, but you're my tour guide. You're supposed to lead me. So he climbed up that thing, and he was scared to death. And he says, well, I really don't want to go. I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to heaven whenever I die. He said, but I'm not. <laughs> I said, but you can, I, it's the simplest thing in the world. He said, well, can you tell me before we go? I said, no, 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 no. When we go down, I'll tell you. He said, you can't tell me right now. I said, nope, not going to tell you right now. But I know I have eternal life, and I know I'm going to heaven when I die. I said, wouldn't you like to know? Yes, I want to know. Uh, where do we get down? So we got down there, and first thing he does, he comes around to me. He says, how do you know you're going to heaven when you die? Let me show you something. And I did it again. <laughs> did he trust Christ? Yes, he did. He trusted Christ. Piece of cake. I walked over to the little counter, and there's a lady sitting behind there, a young college age. And I looked at her, and I says, ma'am. And she looked up. I said, did you know that God loves you so much? He'd rather die than live without you. She looked, and she started crying. Just on that one statement alone. See, a lot of people, they, they've never heard that God loves them. He loves you so much, he'd rather die. That's what Christ did. He really meant it. When we often talk about, man, I'd, I'd die to get this job, or I'd die to meet this girl, I'd die to have this car. And Jesus says, I'd die just to have you have a chance to come and live with me. He loves you so much he'd rather die than live without you. And that's just to give you the chance. And that's what he did for us. Let me tell you another story. I love stories. I went up in Black Duck, Minnesota. 
and we just finished the camp. It was late at night. I'm tired. I'm weary because you go all day and all night long. And so we were driving the car, and I got out of the car, and I had about three or four guys with me. And they got out because they wanted to see what somebody was doing over there on another car. So I got it, and this young kid comes out there, and he says, what can I do for you? I says, check under the hood. So we opened up the hood, and um, I says, um, <clears throat> I thought I'm waiting to show him. I says, where are you going to die? He looked at me from under the hood. He says, to hell. Well, I'm going to heaven. I walked off. I thought that little smart aleck, I'll slam the hood down on him. <laughs> and I realized, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the camp speaker. I can't go thinking like that. I'm supposed to have a good attitude. So I walked back over, and he looked at me from under the hood of the car, and he says, how do you know? I said, how do I know what? He said, how do you know you're going to heaven? I says, well, let me show you something. I pull out my wallet. He's underneath the hood of the car, checking the oil. And I went through the whole thing with him. And I says, that makes sense. He said, yes, it does. Now, I wouldn't have given you a quarter for it. He said, it made sense to him. I said, where are you going to go? Yeah, he said, I'm going to heaven. I said, how do you know? He said, well, you told me. Oh, okay. So I went inside to wait for him to get through. And there were three teenagers in there and a manager sitting there. It's late at night. I walked in, and I'm, I'm so tired. I just leaned up. I don't want to talk to nobody. Sometimes I witness when I don't even want to witness. So I leaned up against the wall, and I'm waiting for him. He opened the door, and he looked in, and he looked over, and he smiled at me. He said, did you tell them? I said, no, I didn't tell them. <laughs> he says, aren't you going to tell them? I said, no, I didn't plan on telling them. And this one kid spoke up and says, tell us what? I said, you don't want to know. He said, yes, I do. I said, you really want to know what I told him? Yes. All right. And I went through every one of them. I said, does that make sense? He said, yes, it does. I said, will you trust Christ right now as your Savior? Yes, I will. I said, what about you? Yes, I will. What about you? Yes, I will. I looked at the man and I said, what about you? He said, nah. You can't win them old fogies sometimes. Just go with the young people, get them all to trust the Lord, and then they'll be old fogies someday. But you learn to explain the gospel. You see, when the Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel, it doesn't mean go to a spot and do it, and go to that spot and do it, and go to that spot and do it. It's as you go in the world. When you're on a trip, when you're going to the grocery store, wherever you're going to get gas, you're visiting somebody, as you go, go with the gospel and look for opportunities. And you'll be surprised the difference that it'll make in your life. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. There's a verse here that I think would be a, a blessing. In Romans chapter 5, I want you to look there in verse, verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. And notice what he says. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. Now, if there's not a reason for him paying for our sins, and that's like you can set that aside and then go preach some good news, well, there is no good news except that. That is the good news. That is the gospel. That's why when we talk about once you're saved, you're always saved. It's because Christ died for how many of my sins? I have no more sins to pay for. That's why I can be saved eternally, forever. No, I'm going to heaven. That's so clear and simple in my mind. But he says here in verse 8, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, not saints, sinners, Christ died for us. You would think that this Christ dying for us must be something important to it. It must be the reason. That must be the foundation of our good news. Christ died for us. Now, I want to give you another one. Look over there in the book of Corinthians. In the book of... I want you to see there in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. This is an awesome portion of Scripture. We often talk about the gospel. Paul lays it out, and this is what he did. He says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now, how can you believe in vain? Because you believe in a Savior that never came back from the dead. But did Jesus come back from the dead? Yes. So my preaching is not in vain. My faith is not in vain. My hope is not in vain. Because Christ did come back 
from the dead. But he says, unless you have not believed, or keep in mind what I'm telling you. And he says, first of all, he says, this is what I did. He said, I preached unto you the gospel. So you see there in verse 3, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that five words, Christ died for our sins. You think Paul preached this? You study the book of Acts all the way through. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I believe churches are getting to the place where they want to preach everything else but the gospel. I was with a bunch of preachers the other day, and I told them, I says, the problem with most churches, they never hear the gospel. They have everybody stand up and let's sing 15 verses of just as I am. And they don't even mean that. They mean just as you ought to be. And instead of singing, uh, Jesus paid it all, theirs is, Jesus paid part, and I paid part myself. Instead of saying, only believe, they say, only behave. <laughs> only be, all things are probable, only behave. They get it all wrong. And I said, they have everybody stand, sing 15 verses, and if you want to be saved, you just step out, and that I'll come on down here, and we'll show you how to be saved. So the only ones who get to hear the gospel are those who step out and come on down and they'll take somebody and they'll show you how to be saved. Now that may be true and they may trust the Lord. But what about the ones who didn't come down? They never heard the gospel. They didn't preach the gospel. But they will give the gospel somebody respond. And if nobody responds, let's close in prayer. And nobody heard the gospel. In a lot of churches, they never hear the gospel because preachers don't even preach it. Most of them don't know how to win somebody to the Lord individually because they don't know how to do it without an owl. We're better than that. You are fortunate that you are in a place that preaches the gospel. And it makes the gospel clear and simple. This is not happening everywhere. You're very unique. You had a unique founder in this ministry right here. And I'm glad to see y'all are continuing in the same trend of where y'all were going. But I want you to see this. And that he was buried in verse 4. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that was the gospel message. Christ died for our sins. Think for a moment. Here I am. I'm a dirty, lousy, stinking, rotten sinner. And I ought to bust hell wide open. And I know it. But God sent his son paid for all of my sins. From the time I'm born to the time that I die. Because see, Christ died 2,000 years ago. I wasn't even born yet. But he paid for all my sins. Whatever my sin is, however many sins I've done, however big or little they were, paid for them all. So when I accept Christ as my Savior, Jesus Christ is my receipt. And I've said this before. The scars in his hands and in his feet, that means he is a living proof of payment. You go to the grocery store, you get a receipt. You get gas, you get a receipt. We get receipts for everything. Christ is my receipt. He is my payment. So when I accept Christ as my Savior, I am getting a living proof of payment. And he says, I'll never leave you and never forsake you. How long will my receipt be good? Forever. That, to me, is good news. Now, let me explain something here in closing. We often use what we call the wallet illustration. And sometimes we might take it for granted. But it's one of the ways that we try to make the gospel, this message, clear to the lost person. So what I do is this. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have sin on us. Now, that wasn't hard to do, was it? You can do that. You can do this. You go home and get in front of a mirror and see if you can lead yourself to Christ. <laughs> and don't quit until you do. We're all sinners. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Uh, number three, C is um, you have to be perfect to go to heaven. And nobody's perfect. Uh, number four is that you can't earn your salvation by your good works. Number five, Christ died. What did he do? Took our sins. Paid for them. Number six, all we have to do is believe. 
And if we believe number seven, you can know you're going to heaven. So you see, the first four is bad news. God loves us, but he hates our sin. We're all sinners. Where you sin is death. That's number two. Number three, you got to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. Number four, you can't save yourself. Not of works. So four is bad news. Good news, Christ died. Number five. And all we have to do is believe he did it for us. So when I trust Christ as my Savior to keep me from going to hell, that makes sense. And all I had to do is believe it. And if I believe it, I have something. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Number seven. So you see, you can't get them to believe until they know that Christ paid for their sin. That's what they're trusting him for. Believe it that he did it. So when Christ says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, as many as receive him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. But it will give you a lot better comfort, and understanding, security, knowing I have all my sins paid for. It's just like I went to the cross and I paid for my sins and I don't have no more sins to pay for. And see, the law cannot condemn a dead man because Christ's death was put to my account. In God's eyes, I died. It's just like I went to the cross and I died and I was buried and I came back from the dead and I ascended and I'm seated in the heavenlies. That's my position in Christ. I'm good to go. It's solid. No questions and no doubts. Like, if I was to offer you my Bible and you accept it, what would you have? Well, a Bible. When, when would you have it? Well, when you accept it. If I offered you my coat and you accept it, what would you have? A coat. Well, if Christ walked in here right now and offered you eternal life and you accept it, what would you have? Eternal life. When would you have it? When you accept it. And he says, I'll never take it away from you. It's everlasting life. That's why he says, these things have I written unto you that believe. Those who do believe, believe what? Christ paid for my sins. Hath everlasting life. It's not just not just believe. As though it has no meaning to it. I'm just trusting Christ. Trusting him for what? I'm trusting him to save me based upon what he did. And he said, all I had to do was believe it. And I believe him. I'm going to heaven because I know God said so. You see, there's nothing else to worry about. I know that I'm going to heaven. And knowing you have eternal life, don't you, don't you want to tell somebody about it? Don't you want to explain that to somebody? To see them come to know Christ as their Savior? Know that they're going to heaven? I had a young kid here named uh, Ivan. There's Ivan. I came in here the, this summer sometime, and he comes walking up to me and says, I'm your son. <laughs> what? You're going to have to explain this. He said he trusted Christ as Savior by watching me on YouTube. But what if that message he heard on YouTube wasn't clear? So I want to see, and I showed somebody this the other day, I've had about 50 people who sent me emails in the last two or three weeks that said they trusted Christ as Savior from all over the world. Now, I could just say, all I'm interested in is get my little pinkies inside the pearly gates and let the rest of the world go to hell. I, but I want to take somebody with me. Don't you want somebody to go with you? Don't you want more than just living your life getting up in the morning, go to work, coming home, go to bed, getting up, go to work, come home, go to bed. There's got to be more to life than that. It's what you're going to do for eternity. And get as many people as you can to trust the Lord. See, I believe that I, I just want to be a fruit picker. I'm not a fruit inspector. So many people are wasting their time being fruit inspectors. Oh, I don't think that's a genuine Christian. Why don't you shine it on yourself? If you had to prove that you're saved because of the evidence in your own life, you'd prove that you're lost. 
Duh. <laughs> Remember this. All that you have to do, because all you can do. There is no other way. There's nothing for you to do. No works for you to perform. You don't have to stop something or join something. You don't have to give any money. You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. I know that sounds strange, but it's the truth. Well, I used to tell them whenever the offering plate come by, look, if you want some, take some out. It's for the heathen anyway. <laughs> I had to stop saying that. <laughs> it was the deacons that were taking them in. Mean, <laughs> you and me sin. Christ paid for the sin. Will you believe it? Let's pray, shall we? With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you believe that he did that for you? You may have heard that all your life, but never really understood. You see, this is telling you what you need to believe. I want you to know we can't save ourselves. Christ died to pay for our sins, and if we believe it, he will save us and give us eternal life. So with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, if what I've said made sense to you, if you've never trusted Christ as Savior before, and you will do it today, you say, preacher, that made sense to me, and I will right now accept Christ as my Savior. I'd like to know, and I'd like to have prayer for you. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that what I said made sense to you. And all I want to do is have a word of prayer for you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you by putting you against a wall and nailing you afterwards. But right where you are, in the quietness of this moment, would you say, Lord, that made sense to me. I will trust Christ right now as my Savior. And friend, if you're doing that, I'd like to know, would you just slip your hand up very quickly, put it right back down, just very quickly, and put it right back down. And one, yes, God bless you, sir. Anyone else, just slip it up and put it right back down. There's no trick to it. I don't know you, probably will never see you again. Even up in the balcony, if you're watching it even online, right where you are, God loves you. Christ paid for your sins. Would you believe he did it for you? And if you believe it, then he puts that payment to your account, and you can know that you're going to heaven right now. Anyone else before we close? It's hard to see everybody in the room. But Father, we are thankful so much for all you've done for us, for loving us so much that you sent your son to pay for our sins so that we can know we have eternal life. And Father, we pray that those who do know and understand will love you enough to tell somebody else. Thank you for this church and for Pastor Jim and others that work here and labor with him. Forgive them a good body of believers, a great ministry, and we thank you for them. In Christ's name we pray, amen.